you know, as a rabbi now since I'm teen years, my headset's on there, right? This time of year is always some of the toughest. I mentioned yesterday that over the next 15 days, I have to do eight different messages. And that's just the fun part, right? over topics that you've read about and taught on year after year after year. You know, how much can you talk about the sacrifice of Isaac? And as I was preparing this year, I, I was doing some research and I came across an article that was kind of upsetting. It's talking about why in the church today, people aren't attending as much, particularly the younger generation. We all call them the millennials. And it's interesting because a lot of them had lost faith in God. But not because of how you might think, but mostly they said because of the fact that they were taught evolution. And once they were taught evolution, they had trouble starting to believe in something that they couldn't see. Which really bothered me because the whole theory of evolution is just that, a theory. Obviously the schools forgot to teach about the missing link. They forgot to mention that Darwin on his deathbed even said by the time he died they should have figured it all out. And he's been dead a long time. But why aren't we reaching that generation? Why are churches around the world getting smaller and smaller? Why are people losing faith in something they can't see or touch? when we can really see and touch God all around us. And that's the reality. When we understand the awesomeness of God, and yes, I believe in the Big Bang Theory. God said bang and it happened. God literally spoke the world into existence. You know, I still have a problem with the image of evolution with these two single cell aminias jumping out of the water. One happened to be male, one happened to be female. Thank God, right? No pun intended. They looked at each other, said, what's your sign? And the next thing you know, over millions and millions and millions and millions of years, here we are today. And they have a problem with God creating us from dust. And we see what's going on. But you know what? The problem is the same in the synagogues today. I was reading an article from a rabbi. And he talked about having to give a message that relates to the people. And so he made up this fictitious person who really was a typical Jewish believer. When I say just believer, I meant just a typical Jewish person who would come to the services twice a year for the High Holy Days and an occasional bar mitzvah. And this rabbi decided to write an email to himself. And I want to share a little bit with you because it really gives us an understanding of what's going on. It says, Dear Rabbi, you probably don't know me by name or face or seat number. Yes, in synagogues you have seat numbers. You're assigned a seat. Since I generally turn up only for the high holy days and for an occasional bar mitzvah, to tell you the truth, I'm still mulling over if I should show up with this, for this Rosh Hashanah at all. I mean, it's cool to see the crowd all decked out, but there are other venues for that. And your jokes are usually not bad. But again, I have better places where world-class comedians have me literally in stitches. 
So I figured I would shoot you this, uh, shoot you a few tips. Just suggestions, mind you, of things that you might say in your sermon that might be of interest to me. If I do actually come, that is. Actually, most of the list ended up as things of what, I, what didn't interest me. Hey, take it or leave it. It's just me, some anonymous, stereotypical Jew. And I thought about this for a minute. Because it's so true, when, when, I, when I started reading what he was saying, my youth came back to me. I remember going to synagogue. We used to go to the temple in downtown Atlanta. And actually one of the biggest reasons why we went, and we'd always go to the earlier service. So you had two services because that was the only time the whole place was packed out. And yes, why did we go to the earlier service? Because you got out a little early, just in time for channel 2, 5, and 11. That's all we had back then to film us coming down the steps and you wanted to get home in time to watch the TV because we didn't have VCRs back then to see if we were going, if you could see ourselves going down the steps. That was the excitement for going to the service. So let's listen to some of the tips that the rabbi gave to himself. If this is a lecture about my bad behavior, I'm not there. Isn't that a typical millennial thought? <laughs> right? If we talk about what's wrong with us, we don't want to hear it. But reality is no one wants to hear that, right? No one wants to hear the bad side. We only want to hear the good stuff, right? Tell me how good I am. But in reality, do we learn from our good? No. We learn from our mistakes. And it allows us to grow and be a better person for who we are. He says, look, it's not like, I'm a, like I believe I'm perfect. Far from it. In fact, I've come loaded with enough guilt to sink a cruise ship. It's part of my operational system. So when somebody hits me, those sensitive spot, soft spots, I just run away. Instead, how about providing us with some good, positive, higher living? Every other religion and faith has uh, their own special offerings. Meditation, mindfulness, yoga, hyper-motivationalism, strategies for stressful life and success. And for good reason, we need it. What do we have to offer? He goes on to say, and I... And I mean tools, daily practices that will change my life. I know we've got them. The kosher thing, the Shabbat thing, the prayers with the black boxes. But I really have no idea how any of these connect to anything spiritually. Maybe they don't. But if they do, why aren't you telling me about it? Even if I'm not ready to give them a whirl, at least I'll know about them. And if you think about it, that's a lot of what Judaism is. We like to wear our talits, our yarmulkes, our tzitzit, our tefillin. But most of us growing up never knew what it was. Especially if you were raised in a reform household like myself. I'll never forget, I was 12 years old it was the summertime, and my parents asked me, what do I want to do for summer? And they gave me a choice. I could have gone to a camp, done some other things, or, they wanted to, or I could go on a trip to Israel. And here is this 12-year-old, never, I don't think I ever even spent a day, at, you know, an overnight at someone's house. Never went to uh, overnight camp. And what did I decide to do? I'm going to Israel. And so I remember my parents flying me up to New York because that's where we left out of. Back then, you could actually go to the gate. My parents were there. All the other parents were there. I had my bag next to me with my camera and all the stuff. And these Orthodox men 
I noticed are walking around and spending 15, 20 minutes with all the kids on the trip, talking to them and doing something. And they walk around and finally they come up to me. And in a heavy Yiddish New York accent, this Lubavitcher looked at me and said, do you have your tefillin? And I looked at him. I said, yes. And he was in shock. I think that was the only one who said yes to him. So he said, where is it? I said, here, in my bag. He said, good boy, and went on. And my mom looked at me, <laughs> having a feeling I didn't quite understand what he had said. And she said, what did he ask you? I said, he asked me if I have my film, the film. <laughs> yes, I'm dating myself. We used to have film that goes in the cameras we did before digital, right? <laughs> At least I didn't have to listen for 20 minutes. But we have to realize that it's more than just wearing a talit or a yarmulke. Our faith in God is deeper than that. It's based on the call that He has for us. Let's face it, we don't want to really be reminded about the Holocaust on this holiday as well. Because we're already reminded how we were persecuted in high school and college for being Jewish if you were raised that way. It was tough enough. Sure, it's important that we never forget and that's what makes us who we are. But there's something more. And that's one thing that we see missing in traditional services. And we know what the answer is. The something more is our faith, not only in God, but in the Messiah. His only begotten Son. The promise that He gave us. See, it's great if we can tie our tefillin and, and do all these things. But walking in His commandments and obeying His Word, that's what makes us who we really are. That's what makes us different. That's what we need to hear about on this Rosh Hashanah. His next point is one of great importance. If I want my values affirmed, I've got Facebook and YouTube. Isn't that true? Right? We learned it all on Facebook now, right? If you don't understand something, what do you do? Go to YouTube, right? You need to fix something? There it is. But all of our answers aren't there. Because those are all made up by man. The true answers are in the Bible. That's where we get how we live our life. Not what latest YouTube is doing, what crazy thing, but how we can get stronger and be bigger in the Lord. He goes on to write, Isn't there anything transcendental, spiritual or otherwise, in our faith? Elsewhere, spiritual liter leaders wear flowing robes. Or at least designer jeans. Most rabbis look like middle management from some bottom line dinosaur corporation. And they talk like them too. Why is that? Okay, I'm not asking you to look like the black turtleneck and jeans CEO of some startup hipster company. And I certainly don't mind learning something about traditional values, social justice, and principles and morals. <coughs> Even if I don't keep them, I'm not going to argue. But isn't it true how we decide what we should look like, how we should be? I kind of love it where you see a lot of these hip, 40 and 50 year old pastors with the shaved, you know, the, the haircut that's really shaved, right? And they got to wear the cool clothes. They got to fit in. 
We're not here to fit in. We're here to fit out. See, we need to have Pete, the world look at us and say, what do you have that I don't have? Now, I do agree with him. We don't have to look like middle management. That's why I don't wear a tie. But we can understand where things are coming from and what we have to do. Another topic that they don't want to hear about is living in Israel. And I'm here to tell you, I'm not going to talk about living in Israel. But if you want to visit Israel next year, we have a great tour, May 26th through June 6th. You can get information on the back table. And it will change your life. And that's what's so interesting about the land. What I love about it is literally the Bible comes alive. You know, everyone says, oh, science disproves the Bible. On the contrary. In fact, science has never disproven the Bible wrong. It's always proven the Bible right. Case in point. Circumcision on what day? Eighth day. Why do we do it on the eighth day? Lord only knows. He said do it on the eighth day. <coughs> we did it on the eighth day, right? It wasn't until the 1960s that science caught up with God and figured out that on the eighth day, the vitamin B12, which is the blood clot, is at the highest point at all, at all times, in the body. God knew what he was doing. God told us not to eat ham, shellfish, lobster, crabs. I know it's hurting some of y'all right now. <laughs> Barbecued pork, all out, right? But look at every diet, and every single diet that is good shows you what? Don't eat those things. Did God not know what he was doing? Of course he did. Science proved him right again. And then let's talk about things that have happened. Like, let's go find these cities that are mentioned in the Bible. And they read about it and they say it should be here. And they go digging there and guess what they find? There it is. Even the walls of Jericho come tumbling down by the sound of seven shofar blasts. And what was that? There's that TV show. I don't think it's on anymore. What was it called? Mythbusters. Remember that? Mythbusters took on the Bible. They did their theory, and what did they prove? They proved that, in fact, it could happen. That sound waves can do it. Even the Mythbusters got it right. And that's what we see what's going on. We need to make sure of what's happening. We might not live in Israel, but Israel needs to live in us. Do you know what's happened this year is nothing short of a miracle. That our president moved the embassy to the rightful capital of the Jewish nation. No other pres a number of other presidents promised it, both Republican and Democrat. None of them ever did it. They fell down to the pressure. This president said, I will stand with Israel. And that makes a difference. Israel needs to be inside of us. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Gentile by birth. God has called us to pray for that nation. He says that uh, they will prosper who bless thee. Who wants to receive blessings? I know I do. It's really simple. 
pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The next thing that the rabbi, this person didn't want to hear, is politics. My politics are not your politics. I used to remember going to the high holiday services and one of the things I did not want to hear was the rabbi's sermon. Not that he wasn't that good or funny. He, rabbi's sermon was actually very funny. He had a little tantan. He had a little, his little pretend puppet toy was his thumb and he would talk to him. It was great for the kids. We were, as adults, we got to worry about him, but that's another story. And he would tell us the adventures year after year, what he would do. But then he would talk politics. And he was on one side, and I was on the other, and neither the two shall meet. We don't need to talk politics in a congregation. That's not what it's here for. Matter of fact, I will, we will never have a politician come and speak from the beam. That's not what it's about. See, we can come from every tribe, tongue, nation, political party, and still gather together and, and communicate and talk. We had a great new members class. It was we, this is the this new members class. You know, all of them are good. This one, Rabbi. Renee, you're in for a treat. When they come into your class, uh-oh, be ready. <laughs> we got into discussing politics, which we normally don't do. I've never done that in any of our new members' class. But what was so great about it wasn't we weren't arguing with one another. We were just talking and sharing and giving different ideas. And that's okay. But I don't need to sit here and preach politics to you. I need to preach the Word of God to you. Because that's what's important. Guess what? There are Christian Democrats. I know for you Republicans, that's a shock. And for you Democrats, there are Christian Republicans. I don't know if there's any Christian liberals. We won't go there yet, no. <laughs> right? We're all walks of life, we have believers in Messiah from all parties. Can't we all just get along? Then the anonymous man made this comment. Please stop ripping apart the world I live in. If Rosh Hashanah is like you say a judgment day for the entire world, why do you rabbis have to play the prosecution? Do you really think people pay for membership? Yes, they also pay for membership to be a part so they could be, that's why we have no tickets required. Membership in your synagogue that, so you can condemn them along with the whole rest of the world? So here's my advice. Do you think, do you know how much further you could get if you acted as our defense attorney instead? Think about it. That's what they're missing. See, in the synagogues today around the world, rabbis are telling people that you've sinned and that you need to repent for your sins. And the only way to repent for your sins is by blood atonement that has to be put on the altar at the temple in Israel. But there's a problem. There is no temple in Israel. So they had to make up a new thing. Now it's your good deeds that get you in or out of heaven. I need to come up, I want, I, I've been saying this for years, I'm going to come up with an app. If you take my thing, I have lawyers here, I will sue you. This is, I'm, but I'm telling you, I want to have a, 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 a mitzvah app. And what you, every day you put in all the good things you did, and they'll get points. But you also have to put in the bad things you do and it will take points away. And we're going to have it where if your bad points are outweighing your good points, for like $1.99 you can get a couple free points. 
right? And at the end of the year, we'll see if you make it into the book of life or into the book of death. But that's not what God has told us to do. See, God has given us the greatest defense attorney. And no, it's not my brother. He might be number two. But the one that he gave us is Yeshua, our Messiah. Who not only, like a normal lawyer, will go and defend us and try to ease the punishment because, let's face it, we're all guilty, right? We all have sin. That's our nature. But God doesn't want us to remember about the, the past. He wants us to focus on the future. So our defense attorney is the one that not only goes before the judge and pleads our case, but he pays the fine. Matter of fact, he paid the fine in advance so that when we go to that court, we're found not guilty because there's no evidence. And that's the promise that God has made to us. That if we return to him, if we receive the ultimate blood atonement that was put on the altar in Israel thousands of years ago for us. That he would atone for our sins. We do have that in our faith in Messiah. We don't need a prosecuting attorney. We need the best defense attorney. And that's what will make the world a better place. When we understand our role as believers, that the proof is in the Word of God. He created us to be worshipers of Him. And He gave us a way to atone for our sins because none of us are perfect. And He knows that. But He still wants a relationship with you. And He's done that through the blood of the Lamb. You see, tonight the books are opened up. The book of life and the book of death. But the rabbis tell us of a third book, the Lamb's book of life. I never understood that growing up as a kid. They, never, they, they talked about it, but they never talked about it. You know what I'm saying? And I understand now why they don't talk about it. Because to talk about it is to tell us what that Lamb's book of life is. That's a Messiah's book. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And by being written in the Lamb's book of life, that determines where we're going to live eternally. The book of life and the book of death is who will live this year, who will die this year. Unfortunately, some will die this year. But by being in the Lamb's book of life, you live forever. And that's the promise that God has given us. The last thing that this anonymous maybe attendee of the Rosh Hashanah service said to his rabbi, keep the message short. And with that, bow your heads and close your eyes. Abba, Father, we just come before you right now. And Lord, as we prepare for this special season, 
as we reflect on our past. But most importantly, Lord, let us look towards our future. Lord, we have fallen short. But Lord, you have given us a Redeemer in your Son, Yeshua. And for everyone who has faith in Him, who accepts Him into their hearts, will be written into the Lamb's Book of Life for eternity. Lord, I ask right now with every head bowed and every eye closed, and Lord, those watching online as well, if you're watching online, wherever you are around the world, you can contact us by the information you see on the screen. And we will pray with you that prayer of salvation. But if you're here right now, and you've never accepted Yeshua as your Messiah into your heart, all you have to do is say a simple prayer. That's all it takes. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Gentile. God came for all of us so that we may be worshipers of Him. If that's you right now, all you need to do is simply raise your hand as an acknowledgement, and we'll say a prayer with you in support. Is there anyone? Anyone at all? And Abba Father, as we continue with our Rosh Hashanah Day service, Lord, we ask for your continued blessings upon us. Lord, guide us this upcoming year. Take us out of our comfort zone. And let us do even more for you and your work. We ask this in your Son, Yeshua's precious name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Amen.